So the second part of the um, this unit today, we're going to talk about, going to give an example of a basic use of doing curve bits. We're going to start with kind of a, a simple example. We're gradually going to go over the next subsequent parts, going to build up the complexity of how we're using curve fit to handle more realistic sorts of situations. So in order to go and use SciPy uh, optimized curve fit, um, as its name suggests, it's designed to go and fit um, curves to sets of data. So therefore, the things we're going to need is a set of measured data points um, in terms of their coordinates x and y. And we're going to need some kind of function, uh, which we can express in terms of f of x and then some number of parameters that we believe should describe the data um, where those p0, p1, p2, whatever, are the fitting parameters. And those are the values we're trying to find. So for a straight line fit, that would be um, f of x, m and c, and m is the gradient, c is the intercept, and the m and the c are the things that we're trying to find um, the best fit values for. And then as we'll see, ideally we'd like to have a set of reasonably good guesses as to where those parameter values should start, should roughly be, um, and that will help curve fit work out uh, where things are. And again, Going back to what we were doing in the earlier units um, of this series. So in unit two, we were looking at um, the um, uh, minimization um, sorts of problems. Um, and um, what we will see is that it's very easy to get stuck in some kind of local minimum. So the better a kind of starting point you can give, then the easier it is for the minimization functions to home in on the best possible set of values. And it's the same as true with curve fitting. The better a guess you can give it to those initial parameters, then the better it's going to do at homing in on those initial values. Sorry, it's unit one we were talking about this in. Um, and then um, optionally, we might have some uncertainties that we need to go and take care of as well. So in other words, our measurements, X and Y, might have some error bars associated with them that we want to include as part of the curve fitting process. So curve fit will then go and do um, all the hard work to try and find the, um, the optimum values of those fitting parameters um, that let the function you've given it describe the data as in the best possible way to, with the smallest distance between the, the, the values you're calculating from your fitting function and the values you've actually measured. Okay, so we're going to start off just by uh, doing the usual sorts of imports and setting things up so that we can go and make the plots in the, in the notebooks and so on. So importing numpy, we're going to import matplotlib so we can plot the data, and from scipy optimize we'll import the curve fit function. Um, okay, and then we also need some data. So in unit two of this series, we, we looked at some data loaded from a file and we'll go and use that again here. Um, so again, this is uh, just how to read your data in uh, from a simple comma separated values file. Um, uh, this is covered in the files video tutorials. Um, and then we can make a nice plot and just show you what it looks like. Um, now, it turns out that, in fact, this data has been generated by calculating values from a function, which is the sum of a cosine and a sine term. And so we can express a function to go and describe what this data should look like in terms of a cos omega 1 x and b sine omega 2 x. And so in this fitting function, we're going to have four different parameters. We're going to have a and b, the amplitudes of the cosine and sine term, and we have omega 1 and omega 2, which is the angular frequencies of those two fitting functions. So what we're going to do is we need to start off by coding this up into a Python function, um, and we're going to do this in the usual sort of way that we've done on the other SciPy video tutorials. That is, um, we're going to write a function where the first parameter is the independent variable x, and all the other parameters are the uh, parameters that are used to go and describe the function. So in other words, we're going to have x, a, omega 1, which I'm going to call w1, b, and omega 2, which we'll label w2. Um, 
And the function basically is triplet. It's one line long, and it's exactly the equation that we've written out there. Um, and as ever, it's always good practice, make a good doc string to explain exactly what's going on there. So that's our fitting function. And we also have loaded in some data. So the next step then is to go and use curve fit. Um, and uh, if we go and look at the manual page, uh, the documentation page for curve, curve fit, we'll see that it takes um, at least uh, three required parameters. So the first thing it needs to go and take is the function that we're going to use to fit the data. So just like fmin and fsolve that we looked at in unit one, this is the name of the function and not a call to it. So we just pass the bare um, uh, identifier for the function. And then we also need to give curve fit the data points that we're trying to fit, fairly obviously. And they're given as an array of x coordinates and an array of y coordinates. And then what we'll find is that curve is going to return two things back to us. And the first thing it's going to return back to us is our set of optimal parameters. So what is the best fit values of, in this case, we're looking at here, A, omega 1, B, and omega 2. And then the other thing it's going to return back to us is a thing called a covariance matrix. And we'll come back and explain what the covariance matrix is all, is all about um, in just a minute. OK, so here we do the curve fit. So I'm going to collect the optimal parameters in a variable called popt. I'm going to collect the covariance matrix in a thing called pcov. Um, and so you can see I'm just passing it here, the fitting function, um, no brackets, no quotes, just it is a, as, a, as a Python identifier, and then the x and y data. And then I'm just asking it to show me the uh, optimal parameters. Um, and it tells me here that it's found the optimal parameters are one for A, one and a half for omega one, one for at B, and 0 0.5 for omega two. And the first thing to realize here is that um, curve fit will always give you back everything in the same order that's defined in the fitting function. So if I had to find my fitting function in terms of A, B, omega one, and omega two, then I would have got back my optimal parameters in the order a, b, omega 1, omega 2. But because I define my fitting function in terms of def fitting func x, the independent variable, and then a, omega 1, b, omega 2, I get my results back as a, omega 1, b, omega 2. So it comes back in the same order. OK, so that's the, um, that's the optimal parameters. Um, uh, so, as I was just saying, they come back to us in the same order that they're defined in the function. And one of the things to kind of get your head around is that curvefit has no actual understanding of what your function means. All curvefit knows is that it has been given a function that's going to take x and then four parameters. And it has no idea at all as to what those parameters should be, what they mean, or what the function is doing. It, it's just, as far as curvefit is concerned, it's just, I call this function and I can see it takes these four parameters in addition to the X coordinates. Um, so that's one of the reasons why curve fit always just returns things in the same orders because it, it, it just simply has no way of knowing what, what the parameters in your function actually mean. So now what about this covariance matrix? Now what the covariance matrix is doing is giving you some extra details about the fitting process. And specifically, is telling you about how changing one parameter changes the quality of the fit. So there are two um, that the actual the actual um, covariance matrix you get back is a, a matrix is a uh, two dimensional array, and it's as many rows and as many columns as you have fitting parameters. So if you have um, four fitting parameters, you get a four by four matrix back. If you have two, it's a two by two matrix that comes back. Um, and it should also be symmetric um, about the diagonal of the matrix. And again, we'll explain a little bit about what's going on there. So this is what our covariance matrix looks like uh, here. Um, and what's going on is that it's telling you um, about how one parameter 
uh, changes the value of another parameter. So if we work our way along the, the row uh, at the top, this is saying, how does the first parameter change? First of all, well, the value of itself. So um, again, we'll explain what exactly that means in a second. The next one's saying that if I change the value of the first parameter, does that force the second parameter to change a bit? Then the, is, if the, I change the first parameter, does this change the third parameter a bit? And finally, if I change the um, first parameter, do I change the value of the fourth parameter? Um, so those diagonal terms of the covariance matrix are telling you about how changing um, each parameter changes the goodness of the fit. So down this diagonal, we have a thing called the variance. And what the variance is, is it's the square of the standard error in the parameters. So that first top left cell there is telling us about how is the square of the standard error in our A. And then the second row of the second column is telling us about the variance in the omega one parameter. And taking its square root would tell us about the standard error in that parameter. And so on the third column, third row is about the variance in the B and the bottom right cell is the variance in omega two. So if we take that diagonal of that matrix and then we take the square roots of those numbers, it's giving us the standard error in the parameters we've found. So that's telling us about, well, how good a fit, how confident can we be about those numbers? So when we said that, oh, well, the best, best fit value of A is one, how confident can we be that it really is one and not 1.001 1 .001 or two or some other number? Um, the off diagonal terms are, as I said, telling you about how the how independent the parameters are of each other. So if we have a big number in an off diagonal term of this uh, two by two array, they're saying that um, one of those parameters changing a little bit also changes another parameter. In other words, those two parameters are not really independent of each other. And one of the principles of least squares fitting that kind of makes it work is an assumption that your parameters are independent of each other. So if you see big numbers in the off diagonal terms, um, then it tells you that your fitting function is not really um, being very well behaved and you need to be a little bit cautious about what's going on. Um, what do we mean by big numbers? Well, by big numbers, we mean that the off diagonal terms are um, big compared to the diagonal terms and also the diagonal terms are not vanishingly small compared to the um, optimal parameters. So in this case, these numbers are all tiny. And that's because essentially there's no noise in our data set. So we're able to perfectly fit the data. And therefore we can say to a very, very high degree of confidence that the value of A really was one. So um, as I said, we, what we can do is we can take the square root of the diagonal of that covariance matrix, and that's our standard errors. And there is a handy way about going getting the diagonal of a 2D array, and that's the np.diag function. So just feed np.diag um, with a covariance ma uh, matrix, that 2D array PCOV, and then I need its square roots because you need the square roots of the uh, diagonal to get go from the variance to the standard error. And then this gives you a calculation of the standard errors. And as I said, these are all absolutely tiny numbers because we've got no, no noise in the data. There's no scatter. OK, um, it's also a good practice to go and check that uh, your fitting has actually worked correctly. And so um, generally what you should go and do is you should go and uh, plot your data uh, using your optimum parameters um, that you've just calculated and overlay it over the top of the data points and just check that nothing seems to have gone horribly wrong. And so in this case here, this is what I've gone and done. I've plotted the X and Y data points as uh, red circles. And then I've made another plot where I plot the um, uh, X data points. Um, and then I've called my original fitting function with a value of X. And I've used this star P opt syntax, which just basically feeds all those optimum parameters and uses them in the function call. So I've discussed uh, the, the star um, syntax in the syntax, uh, no, it's in the functions video tutorial. So it's in about um, functions two or three, I think. 
Um, uh, and again, I've drawn that with a blue line and shown it as a, as a, as a best fit line um, so we can compare what's going on. Uh, if I see there are problems, then there are a whole bunch of things you can go and use to debug your code. And if you look at the debugging uh, unit five tutorial, then that's all about how to debug curve fits and how you should go about um, trying to work out what's going wrong if your curve fits aren't, aren't working as expected. OK, um, yeah, sorry, the reference here is wrong. It's actually unit five now with the debugging tutorial. OK, so we can actually get an idea of what's going on during this fitting. Um, so what we can do, a bit like we did when we we're looking at fmin and fsolve in unit one, I'm going to write a special fitting function that's going to make some plots as it goes along, just so we can see what happens. So I've replaced my fitting function with a new one, uh, and this one is now going to actually um, plot some data um, as we go along, and so we can get an idea of um, of, of how well we're doing with um, uh, the plot running. OK, so now we're going to go and use it uh, in the same way. So this is basically the same curve as call as we just did, but now it goes and actually makes a plot for us. So I start off, I plot the X and Y data, and now as I call curve fit, as curve fit works, it's going to make a plot and add a line to our graph to show us how, how it's doing. And so it starts off with the dark blue plot, um, and that um, you can see really doesn't fit the data at all. But very, very rapidly, as it works, it manages to tune itself up so that the uh, A, the B, the omega-1, and the omega-2 get closer and closer to being good enough. And you'll actually see that over the last few data points, where we're sort of into the green-colored curves, it's got very, very close, and it's basically going through the data points. And so this is showing you that in order to go and do this fit, it then had to go and call the fitting function um, about 40 times um, to... Uh, get a good fit through all the data points. Um, now, of course, real data has noise in it. Um, uh, now, this is not a problem for the curve fitting. It'll still work um, when you have noise. And we can see how that happens. So what we can do is we can just go and add um, some random noise. And we'll just add um, a noise of about um, uh, uh, a sort of standard deviation in the noise of about 0.25. Um, and so we go about doing the same as we did before. So what you can see now, the red data points have got a bit of scatter in there, but the curve fit has worked just fine. It's managed to find a way of fitting that data just absolutely fine. I haven't had to change the code at all. It's just using exactly the same code as we had before. It's just now the data is a little bit noisy. The difference comes when we look at the optimum parameters and the uncertainties we've got in them. So what I'm showing you in this table, and we're going to look at quite a few little tables like this in this unit. So the first column is the optimum parameters. So before that was exactly 1, exactly 1 1.5, exactly 1, and exactly 0 0.5. And now you can see it's close, but it's just a little bit off. The second column is the error. So that's calculated by doing the uh, square root of the diagonal of the covariance matrix. And now you can see those errors are not 10 to the minus 18. They're actually um, uh, a kind of real sort of appreciable size. So then next to it, I'm going to show you the, the actual correct values we should have got. And then the final column, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the difference between the value we found with curve fit the correct value i'm going to divide that by the error the size of the the size of the the error we had in that fitting value and so what you can see is that the first three parameters all fitted within the error so when we said it should be um 1.51 plus or minus 0 0.01 then we'd fitted the correct value which is 1.5 within one standard error. You'll see that the last value is out. It's 1.78 um, times the error. Um, now, OK, it's great. We've got three of the parameters are less than one standard error. Is it a problem that the final one is wrong by more than one standard error? And the answer is no. In fact, when one understands that the standard error you quote in a measurement is essentially to do with how far out from your 
expected value would you expect to be? Um, and it's essentially measuring the width of a um, normal distribution curve. Now, the standard deviation of a normal distribution curve only encompasses about 67% of the, of the error of the area under a normal distribution. So in other words, what I'm saying is that two thirds of the time you would expect to be within one standard error and one third of the time you would expect to be more than one standard error out from the right answer. If you go out to uh, two standard deviations, so two times the error, then 90% of the time you expect to be right. If you go out to three, then it's about 99% of the time. And if you go out to about five standard errors, then it's uh, something like 99.999% of the time you're gonna be within five standard errors. So it's not a problem that we're more than one standard error out. It would be a problem if we were five or six standard errors out, but to have one out of four parameters out by more than one standard error is in fact what you would expect. <laughs>